Let's pick it up fresh, y'all. Welcome to the Word Made Fresh podcast, where every week we serve you the Word of God so that you can grow in spirit and in truth with the King of the Universe. I'm your host, Josh Inslee, and I am so glad you're here today. Welcome back. It is season two, episode one, The Word Made Fresh. We're going to kick it off uh, with a bang this, uh, this season, I think, with my good friend, David Wilbur. So today is May 11th, 2022. Guys, uh, I have taken a small sabbatical. I have been gone for, uh, gosh, I don't know, about uh, six weeks, probably, something like that. <clears throat> but uh, I appreciate you being here. I hope that we can uh, provide you with some more good quality content <clears throat> this season. Uh, looks like we're going to do about 20 episodes per season. So uh, you can check out season one at wordmadefreshpodcast.com wordmadefreshpodcast.com. I just launched that site. I actually forgot to put that in the YouTube description below, but you can check out wordmadefreshpodcast.com. <clears throat> um, while you're down there in the description, you should totally check out all the other links that I have, uh, including a link to my website, so my just general ministry website, which I have updated and changed a bunch of stuff for. Um, really been building it in. I'm trying to make maybe a possible career transition, uh, so I've been getting into uh, website construction, SEO, stuff like that. <clears throat> Um, but anyway, so uh, check out my website, check out uh, my Patreon if you want to support, financially support this ministry. That would be wonderful. Uh, I'd be super grateful. I will be traveling later this month to, actually it'll be the first weekend of next month. So um, <clears throat> the first, yeah, first weekend in June to Norman, Oklahoma to go to Messiah Meetings, Norman. I'm going to be teaching on the deity of Christ from Isaiah 6 because John's gospel tells us that when Isaiah looked into the uh, the heavenly throne room that he saw Jesus there. And so uh, I'm going to go to that text and, and teach the deity of Christ from that, from a new Testament perspective. <clears throat> um, but guys that cost money. And right now, if you have seen prices on stuff, uh, prices are very high, pretty much on everything. So uh, if you would like to give financially to that, feel free. My Patreon is down there. That would be super helpful and awesome. Um, there's a couple other links down there. You can check out my book, my latest book on the doctrine of the Trinity. I'm an unapologetic Trinitarian. So is my friend David, who is going to be with us later. Uh, and uh, you can check out his book too on Remember the Sabbath. So um, David has really been focusing on the Sabbath, clearly, because that's what we're talking about tonight. And um, <clears throat> you can you can get his book, read. He does a, he does a phenomenal job uh, defending the Sabbath for Christians. Uh, guys, the, the first chapter alone where he exegetes Matthew chapter 5, uh, which was really the, the topic of the discussion for this debate that he had with uh, uh, R.L. Solberg a few weeks ago. Um, but man, it's, it's worth the money alone just for that. <clears throat> and one more, one more um, link I think is down there, and there's probably some more down there I'm missing. Uh, my Facebook, my Twitter, TikTok, stuff like that. The Rock Hill Statement is now linked below this video. The Rock Hill Statement, really quickly, is a statement <clears throat> for uh, pronomian Christians. It's a it's a 10-article statement, much like the Nashville Statement, if you've ever seen that. If you've not ever seen the Nashville Statement, you can go to nashvillestatement.com, and it's a, um, I think there are 13 articles or so on the Nashville Statement, and it lays out biblical uh, marriage and sexuality, and it's it's articles with an affirmation and, an, and a denial and you can sign it to say, yes, I agree to these, uh, to this statement as a whole. Well, we've done that for the pronomian Christianity movement, and it is the Rock Hill statement. It is not associated with any particular church at all. I am from Rock Hill, or I live in Rock Hill um, at this point, and the people who helped facilitate it and put it together are from Rock Hill. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we, uh, we named it that, but it is, it is 10 basic uh, contentions or 10 basic articles of Christian doctrine that we affirm and uh, it, and we want people to sign it if they agree to it and we hope that it serves as a um, we hope that it serves as a uniting force for pronomian Christians something that we can uh, so that we can all say hey we agree to all this stuff and we are going to network together we are going to um, have conferences and this is going to be what's aligning us. So the teachers and the speakers of these conferences are going to have to sign the Rock Hill statement so that we, it's like a vetting process. So if you, if you want to go down there and check that out, it's, it's 10 quick articles, feel free to jump in, check it out and uh, sign it. If you agree to it. <clears throat> All right. I think, I think that's just about everything. 
uh, so far before the preliminary or the preliminary stuff before I get David in here. <clears throat> um, so just real quick though, before I I checked the or I watched the debate live, I thought it was a fabulous debate. I think David really came in with uh, good arguments. And um, tonight we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about his arguments. We're gonna talk about maybe some stuff that he didn't get a chance to actually bring up or say in the debate. Um, and then maybe some takeaways, some general takeaways, uh, and what, what he thinks about it. Maybe if there's going to be any kind of future debates or if this is going to be, um, anything he wants to do in the future. So, uh, with that, I would like to, uh, go ahead and bring in David. So here you are, David, how are you doing? Hey, do, doing good brother. How are you? Good. So, uh, super glad to have you on guys. If you don't know David, uh, David is, uh, an author an apologist, uh, just all, all around great guy. He's one of my great friends. Um, really appreciate David's uh, contributions to scholarship and to defending the faith. Um, but yeah, David, just tell our, our audiences a little bit about you if, you've, if they've not seen you or uh, just, just what do you do? Who are you? Uh, well, first, man, it, it's a, an honor to be with you. Thank you so much for, for having me on your show. And um, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is David Wilbur, not related to Paul Wilbur. <laughs> um, and I uh, am an author, uh, Christian, messianic apologist. Um, I focus a lot on pronomian theology, as, as you do as well, and um, defending the validity of God's law, the Torah, for Christians today. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, check out all my content um, at, at davidwilber.com. Um, you know, uh, all my articles and videos, teachings are all there. Uh, and my new book that uh, you mentioned um, that was recently released, you can check that out at sabbathbook.com. So uh, should be easy to remember, just sabbathbook.com. And uh, yeah, I well, hope you check it out. You know, I'm really surprised you got that domain name now that I think about that. Yeah. Yeah, gonna... I, 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 I was, uh, I was uh, surprised as well. So yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, right when I saw it, I had to snag it. <laughs> oh yeah, of course, of course. <clears throat> well, cool. So, um, so the debate happened, what was it, last Tuesday, last Monday? Uh, God, Monday, right? Monday, yeah. Monday of last week. So uh, we're a little bit uh, past a week out from from the debate. <clears throat> and uh, so I would like to, I guess, just start off and ask you, David, what are your overall thoughts about the debate? So just uh, now that you've had a week to just reflect and mm -hmm. think on it, what are some things that um, you just you just took away from it? Just overall, what, were you pleased with it? Was it was it something that you uh, enjoyed doing or do you regret it? What is it? Uh, overall, I, I thought the debate went really well. Um, uh, uh, my opponent, Rob, uh, R.L. Solberg, he, uh, he was just, a, he, he's a great guy. And, and despite our disagreements, you know, he is, uh, he, he's just very friendly, uh, and charitable. And so, um, yeah, we, you know, I, I'm sure we, we agree on a lot of other things, uh, but yeah, he um, he was just a pleasure to talk to, um, and I think overall, I, I think it went really well. I've been getting a lot of feed, uh, really great feedback from it. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like I personally did very well in the debate. I I feel like um, you know, people that watched the debate with an open mind, uh, of course, you know this is my opinion, but but sure. I think that uh, I think people that watch it with um, with an open mind, I think that they will see that my position was uh, more strongly supported by the the biblical evidence. Um, of course, I have a bias, as I said, but <laughs> but but I think um, you know I, I I just feel pretty good about it. I feel really good about it. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll echo that real quick. On uh, I think you did fabulous, just from a from a guy who watches a lot of debates. Uh, I, I watched so much, I actually watched the Bonson, uh, classic two classic Bonson debates today. Those, those are so good, but man, your nice. opening statements. Uh, yeah. I mean, you just like, you just dumped all of the scriptural data, uh, and support for your position, I think in that opening statement. And, uh, it, it was just, it was just great. It was just fabulous. I think you did a really, really good job. Uh, you, I, I can tell that you are a seasoned debater, uh, that you are, you are really getting in and, um, I guess finding your zone there uh, with debating, you're you're very analytical. You're right to the point, and I I appreciate that. Um, I just thought it was very meticulous, so very good. 
Uh, yeah, th- sh- thanks. Go thanks, ahead. man. Yeah, r- I really appreciate that. Yeah, it, it was um, really quick. Yeah, the, the I guess the only complaint I had, you mentioned my opening statement, was mm-hmm. that I used the dang wrong microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I had it on my computer mic for my entire opening statement, and you actually sent me a message, and I didn't even I didn't see it until after my opening statement that I yeah. was using the wrong mic, and so that that's like the only thing I would change if uh right. Well, I guess back. that's better than what we did the first time I had you here to talk about my book was we left it on that mic the whole time, so uh, that audio yeah. is forever <laughs> cursed for whatever episode that was in season one. Um, but yeah, now that we've got your your mic good to go i think that's a lot better but yeah uh it did not it did not take away from the content that you dropped in your opening statement um it just sounded a lot better once you got to the the first rebuttal (laughs) um so so speaking of uh, opening statements rebuttal stuff like that so tell me about the debate structure did you like how the debate was structured and how the i I think it followed a classic opening opening rebuttal rebuttal cross exam uh, kind of stuff did do you enjoy that or is there anything you would tweak personally i really enjoy that that format personally um i i think it's a good mixture uh because it really gives uh both people a chance to make their case and to respond um and and there's also a good mixture of um interaction as well because you have the cross exam section mm-hmm. where there's a little bit more uh direct pushback on 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 things and so um i prefer that style uh over just you know conversational uh debates J- just because i in, in in those types of debates i don't really feel like there's enough time for people to really appropriately make their case and, mm-hmm. and respond because uh too much stuff gets kind of thrown at you and, and so right. i um i am i'm a really big fan of that format um i you know i really enjoy watching william lane craig debates and I, he's okay. uh he's used to that format a lot um in the debates that i've seen and um i i think that i think i would make the opening statements a little bit longer uh the the opening statements for 15 minutes each Mm-hmm. I would pro- I would probably have extended if if it were up to me I probably would have extended it to 20 minutes and then yeah. also um uh 10 minute uh rebuttals uh we did have 10 minute rebuttal times but but yeah I, I would I would extend the opening statements to 20 minutes just because I I felt like um I was uh kind of not able to take a breath trying to get everything in <laughs> um but right. Yeah, so I, I, I really like 20-minute uh, opening statements, and I guess people kind of chop those down to 15 sometimes just to save time because debates take a long time. Uh, that's just mm-hmm. the nature of them. <clears throat> um, but me, like I like to listen to stuff on YouTube at like two times speed and just like sit there and uh, just uh, consume it. And so I don't really mind if it goes too long. Plus, you know, it's more information. So yeah, 20-minute mm-hmm. opener, I, I enjoy that. And then 10-minute rebuttals I think would be would be cool. Um, there's a There's a just... Shameless plug for another channel, uh, Nate Sala. Do you ever uh, listen to Wise Disciple with Nate Sala? He's mm-hmm. a former debate teacher. He's a he's an evangelical, <clears throat> and he uh, he now he's full time in ministry on YouTube and stuff. And he he takes mm-hmm. classic debates like uh, theistic debates, and he uh, judges them, and he and he tries to like show you the strengths and the weaknesses of all those debates. And he always hones in. Um, pretty much, he says, "Watch it, watch the debate." But then he hones in on the cross examination because cross examination is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. that's the most. Uh, it's definitely the most tenacious part of. I don't know if that's a word. It's got the most tension uh, in the cross examination. Um, and I think you did really well in yours. Uh, and that's just. I don't know. That's the, that's the part where I like sit back in my chair and really get interested and listen is because uh, I want to see all of those contentions be challenged in the cross examination. Right. Um, so I'm always down for more longer cross exam sections, but yeah, I, I agree. I like that. I like that uh, format. <clears throat> um, and and I, I guess let me ask you this: Have you ever done a debate where you weren't uh, the affirmative in the debate? Yes, uh, I did a debate um, on the Book of Enoch. The and the thesis uh, of the debate. The thesis of the debate was: Is Fort First Enoch inspired scripture? Right, and you so, took the denial. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I obviously, you know, pulled a, uh, you know, the 66 book canon. And so I sure. do not think, yeah, but yeah, I, I did take the denial on that. Okay. So you got to go second and close the debate in that one. Cause typically the affirmative goes first and opens, uh, 
at least in what I've seen. Actually, I, I got to open in that one too. <laughs> oh, so. Really? So you've opened every I, debate? I've opened every formal one I've had, yeah. Oh man, oh man, yeah. So. I guess you kind of open the ones on Facebook, the informal ones, because you're the one that posts something and then everybody <laughs> gets upset <laughs> at you. <laughs> Same thing for me, I get. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to get into the debating world one day, uh, hopefully when time, when I get some more time on my hands, I can do that. But so for now though, um, seeing you and watching you is, is awesome. So, uh, well, let's, let's move on. Uh, let's see. So tell me about, uh, your relationship with your opponent, because a lot of people look at debates and they're like, Oh, these guys must hate each other. These guys must be like mortal enemies. Um, how long have you known, uh, Mr. Salberg? And, uh, did you have any kind of pre-debate interactions with him and uh, just tell us like the context of that relationship so we know who the two people are that were were debating each other sure uh yeah rl solberg he is uh he's kind of I, I guess for a few years now he has been actively um opposing pronomian theology or uh, what he calls torahism and he actually wrote a book about it and so, and that's a big uh, focus of his ministry is countering um, stuff that you and I believe, like uh, the validity of the Sabbath and the, the dietary laws and the festivals and things like that. So a, bi a big focus of his ministry is countering um, our beliefs uh, on, on those issues. And um, he did a response to one of the videos that I did with 119 Ministries. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was on Colossians 2. Um, and so he, so he's interacted with on his channel with, with some of my uh, teachings. And I had a little bit of interaction with him here and there. Like I commented on his uh, video. I, I think I think all I really said was thank you for being you know so charitable and and mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, because he really is a, a, a nice guy. He he's he seems like a really genuine dude uh, who loves the Lord and and you know he just he has his opinion on on what is biblical and uh, I disagree with some of his opinions um, and that's the way it is. But but you know at the end of the day we're brothers in Christ and you know we're we're just trying to uh, get to the truth and and I I do think that he's a genuine guy. Uh, but yeah, we, we've had a little bit of interaction here and there just on YouTube uh, comments and on Twitter here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the the debate kind of happened because uh, I was familiar with Solberg's stuff. And I actually cite him in my book, Remember the Sabbath, mm -hmm. because I bought his book, Torahism, to just to, you know, familiarize myself with his arguments and see what right. what he has to say. And so I... I quote him or i cite him a couple of times in my book and engage with his arguments there so i'm familiar i'm familiar with his arguments and then um the people that hosted the debate on the uh faith uh unaltered um mm -hmm. channel they approached me and, and um put together this debate between he and i on the sabbath and and that's just kind of how it all came together but yeah we, we've interacted a little bit uh beforehand uh, it's it's always been very friendly and I think even during the debate, you know, even though it was um, heated at moments, I, I think, uh, you know, the the love of Christ shone through, I, I, I hope, you know, at least on my end and I, surely on his end as well. Uh, I, I think uh, we were both just very charitable toward each other and and uh, challenging each other, of course, but but also very loving. Sure. So we would consider this uh, an in-house debate. Is that what I'm hearing? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah. That uh, I think that I think that sets the stage a lot of times for debates for um, just a different atmosphere. When you know that the guy that you're debating is your brother, <clears throat> it, 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 there's kind of like that whole like iron sharpens iron mentality that you've got to have because you're like I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not here to personally and you should never at a debate obviously go uh, ad hominem and, and personally attack somebody. Right. But <clears throat> but I think I just, I just think it's different when you're looking across the uh, the stage. Well, you know nowadays we do it on the internet. Uh, but when, when you would look across the stage or you'd see the other guy on the screen uh, and he's your brother, then I think it just it kind of sets a different environment um, versus when you would have guys like Hitchens versus Craig uh, back in the day when they're, they're polar right. opposites. They were very charitable to each other, but at the end of the day, they're both going home to different lifestyles and different worldviews, and uh, it's just not the same. So uh, glad we can have uh, good, passionate debates with our brothers and sisters uh, in the Lord and it not become a personal thing where at the end you shake hands or you say thank you uh, and, and you go your way and you have your 
Uh, you have your moments of of heatedness, I think is what you called it. But uh, man, if I mean, if 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 you don't go into a debate and get a little bit quote unquote heated, uh, then I don't think you did your homework because you should be passionately, uh, you know, pushing your yeah. viewpoint and and really trying to poke holes in your opponent's um, contentions. So <clears throat> yeah, so hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody else could see that. I saw that. I saw two two dudes who cared about each other, didn't think that the other one was cut off uh, anathema or anything like that. So. Um, so yeah, awesome. I, I appreciated it. Okay, well, um, let's see, David. Let's let's talk about maybe some <clears throat> some nitty gritties of the debate. Some points that maybe you didn't get a chance to flesh out because I think you even told me you're like I wrote so many notes and had so much stuff prepared and I only got like a fraction of it uh, that I actually got to engage with. Um, so what do you? Uh, let's see. In terms of in terms of points. What do you think were some of the bigger moments or like the bigger takeaway uh, moments of the actual contentions and defendings mm -hmm. and um, and pointing out maybe some holes and some stuff? So just just talk through that for me. Sure. Well, uh, so I, I made a case from the from the New Testament. Ba basically, my entire contention was that the New Testament agrees with the Old Testament. That God's expectation that we keep the Sabbath did not change in the New Testament. And so I made my case from the New Testament that the Sabbath is still expected. Uh, you know, God still expects us to keep the Sabbath. And uh, I, you know, I, I put my arguments out there, and, and I, I believe the arguments are pretty compelling. Me too. Um, I, I think that <laughs> I think the biggest takeaway, in my opinion, uh, and and uh, I nailed him on this, I think, in, in the cross exam. Um, I, I actually, uh, to give a little bit of background, I was reading his book. He's, he's written a couple books, um, mm -hmm. Torahism, and he wrote another book called Divergence. And I was just kind of reading through his book just, just to see if there was anything in there to kind of, kind of give me more insight into you know, his, his uh, beliefs. And I saw a quote where he basically said explicitly, Scripture nowhere overturns the keeping of the, or no, he said scripture nowhere explicitly overturns the keeping of the weekly Sabbath or states that it has come to an end. And mm. I like when I saw that quote in his book, I like immediately freaked out. I'm just like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, and I ran yeah. upstairs and grabbed a highlighter and highlighted it. Um, but then and then I opened up my cross exam document <laughs> and <laughs> and my my question, the first question you can hear it in the cross exam was, Rob, do you think scripture anywhere explicitly overturns the keeping of the weekly Sabbath or states that it has come to an end? So right. I phrased my question exactly how he uh, states that in his book. Yeah. So, of course, he, he said no. And I think that is a huge takeaway because basically what he's saying is that his position that the sabbath is no longer required is at best only implied based on these other arguments that he's made mm -hmm. he's 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 made other arguments that it's not explicitly repeated in the new testament um he's made arguments that that you know a new covenant in implies a new law or a new expression of the law is how he puts it we can maybe talk about the, that a little bit later or that it was given only for jewish people that gentiles were not expected to keep it so he he um his position that the sabbath is no longer required for christians that best only implied is not explicit. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him, I'm like, given that God has explicitly and repeatedly commanded that the Sabbath be kept, if he wanted to say that it uh, no longer needs to be kept. Why would he not say so explicitly? Why mm -hmm. would he only imply it? And, um, you know, I, I think that that is a... Uh, I don't think that the arguments that he gave that imply that the Sabbath is no longer required uh, are compelling. Um, mm -hmm. I do not think that they uh, that you know they were that they're able to overturn the explicit and repeated statements in Scripture that do affirm you know that the Sabbath should mm -hmm. be kept. 
And, and so I, I think that was a really big point, uh, in my opinion. That's That was probably the biggest takeaway, uh, in my opinion, is, is uh, that admission of his... Okay, yeah, I think that I think that was a a, a big blow to his argument um, because it seems like <clears throat> that Rob's, like you said, his entire viewpoint on this is he has to he has to gamble all of this on like implicit uh, passages that are super questionable to to arrive at such a conclusion um, right. and has to look at the the rest of the scripture of all those explicit passages and say, no, this, this slight little I- implication in the new Testament <clears throat> has to override all of that. And, uh, and I, and I like how you, I like how you, t- uh, you compared that to another prominent figure within, uh, some circles on the internet, Matthew Vines, uh, right. if you don't know Matthew Vines, Matthew Vines is a progressive Christian. He's a Harvard grad. He's a brilliant guy. Uh, I've read his book to, to read his argument, to get his argument, just like, uh, we always should. Um, and I, I, do you, do you see a similarity in the way Matthew Vines makes his arguments for the progressive positions, uh, and, and kind of how Rob does the same thing? Oh yeah, I, I do. I definitely see some, uh, similarities. Um, obviously Rob is, is not for, and he said this in the debate, you know, he's not, he's not a progressive Christian, you know, he right. disagrees with progressive christian theology on issues like sexual morality um but i believe the logic of his position i I believe progressive christian theology is the logical implication of his position um Mm. rob's rob's arguments are are really similar to andy stanley's Mm -hmm. Uh, you you remember andy stanley from the old testament (laughs) <laughs> I, and and Rob ex- explicitly states that because Jesus fulfilled the law, mm-hmm. um, we are no longer bound by the, the requirements of the law. That's that's um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that that's right. basically what he said in his book. And I did quote him in in the cross exam on that point, mm-hmm. right next to a Matthew Vines quote, where Matthew Vines essentially says the same thing, except Matthew Vines' point is that. The commands regarding sexual morality no longer apply to us. Right. And so, yeah, I, I do think that the, the logic is the same. Uh, and I think that if Rob is consistent with his logic, that, that progressive Christianity is that end goal. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think that Rob, thankfully, is, is inconsistent <laughs> in his, in his <laughs> <Right>. theology. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, I... Um, that that's uh yeah that that was a another big point i believe <clears throat> yep and again we're not saying that rob is a progressive progressive christian which right, by the way right. is uh an oxymoron in my uh b- book of terms uh just as much as a married bachelor is or a, right. or a round triangle uh progressive christianity is is not true christianity but and rob is not that uh, there just seems to be a little bit of overlap in terms of logical arguments and argumentation from guys like that. And, and, and again, that's, that's the reason I think you and I are, are what we call pronomian is because we see those logical ends to that kind of thinking and that kind of argumentation and where it would take you. Um, because if something, <clears throat> if something has to be explicitly repeated in the new Testament for it to be uh, continued from the, uh, from the explicit uh, repetitions all throughout the Tanakh, then we've got a lot of things we have to abandon. Uh, like I, I bring up just a couple, like cross dressing is one that is classic. That it, it's it's explicitly outlawed within the Torah, and it is not explicitly outlawed in the New Testament. Now you can imply that it is with Paul's, you know, uh, sexual immorality. But I mean, how is I mean, cross dressing isn't really like a sexual act anyway. It's it's just kind of like a a breaking a paradigm and breaking a mold of another way. And it, I mean, you can really stretch and really imply things, uh, but I don't think that's any. I don't think that has any kind of footing compared to the explicit uh, uh, decrees within the within the Tanakh uh, prior to that. So, <clears throat> yeah, I I agree. Rob's it's just a, it's just a shaky ground, and it's it's kind of hard to to stay there um, without some kind of explicit uh, continuation. But but honestly, too, I think there are some uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna talk about implicit uh, commands or implicit things about the Sabbath. Uh, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm sure you do. I've read your book. Uh, but I, I think that Jesus is implicitly um, like encouraging and commanding as God 
the continuation mm-hmm. of the Sabbath for his people uh, with stuff like, you know, when he teaches on the Sabbath, Sabbath was not made for man. Man was made for the Sabbath. Um, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and did the stuff. Um, and in the classic one, like, don't let your flight be on the Sabbath. That's clearly mm-hmm. a uh, something that's going to happen after he is dead and resurrected. So the, those, did you see those implicit things too about the Sabbath? Um, uh, yeah, I did. Hold on, my daughter's in here. Hey, sweetheart. <laughs> Oh, I love you. Aww. All right, I'm in the middle of something, sweetheart. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, just give me a good, good night <laughs> hug. Um, can you shut the door, please. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Where were we? All right. Um, uh, implicit Sabbath uh, regulations, like Jesus speaking positively about the Sabbath. And- oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, he's teaching how to keep the Sabbath, um, and uh, that that was. I actually have a I have an article I was reading from Dr. Roy Gain mm-hmm. um, where uh, he um, was talking. I was reading the article today. I'm trying to pull up the quote. He was talking about how Yeshua, Jesus, he was he taught about how to keep the Sabbath. You know, he mm-hmm. was teaching. He was really as Lord of the Sabbath. He was giving the restoring the Sabbath to its proper meaning and and application because the sabbath had been so distorted in, in his day mm-hmm. by by the teachings of the scribes and pharisees right. uh and so yeshua was countering the scribes and the false teachings of the scribes and pharisees and restoring the sabbath to its uh, to its true meaning and function mm-hmm. and, and application and so uh roy uh roy gain he said Quote, why would he restore something that he was about to do away with? That would make as much sense as remodeling a house before demolishing it. End oh, quote. <laughs> yeah, and as, I just good. I just thought that was a, a great analogy. Um, yeah. But but yeah, the the very fact that he's teaching how to keep the Sabbath and he's affirming that he is that the Sabbath is a sign of his lordship it's part of his divine messianic claim that he is lord of the sabbath why why would he then do away with it that doesn't make any sense um you know he he does um he he teaches us how to keep the sabbath because that's exactly what we would expect if he wanted us to keep it uh yep. properly so um there there are those commandments and, and obviously Matt um you know we're, we're talking about these commandments that are not explicitly repeated in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. I made the point, you know, that a commandment does not have to be explicitly repeated to be reinforced. Mm-hmm. Uh the New Testament does reinforce uh uh the command against cross-dressing for example, which is the example uh of a commandment that you gave in Passages like Matthew 5, 17 through 20, where Yeshua affirms the ongoing authority of the entire Hebrew scriptures, all of the commandments right. in the Old Testament. He affirms the validity of those commandments. Right. And so, and, and um, even brought up that, um, you know, some scholars like Dr. Michael Brown, who doesn't agree with me on the Sabbath, but he appeals to Matthew 5, 17 through 20, uh, to say um, in his book that was actually a response to, to Matthew Vine's book, but oh, he yeah. appeals to Matthew 5, 17 through 20 and says that um, based on this passage, Yeshua um, affirmed the laws against homosexual practice. And so mm-hmm. I think this I think the same thing could be said for the Sabbath, um, that uh, the commandment to keep the Sabbath is reaffirmed in that passage, and Yeshua says to keep even the least of the commandments. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's a lot there, uh, but but yeah, the, <laughs> if another point that he he made is that um, we're in the new covenant now, and so the Sabbath, mm-hmm. um, the way that he put it uh, is that the Sabbath is not done away with per se, because he admits that the Sabbath is not done away with. But in the new covenant, there is a new expression of keeping the Sabbath. So we no longer have to keep the Sabbath according to the commandment, like, you know, the Ten Commandments, the the way that the fourth commandment says we ought to keep it. That way of keeping the Sabbath is done away with. We're We're now in a new expression of keeping the Sabbath. But really, there's nothing—I um, don't see that in Scripture. Um, 
everything in the New Testament, the, the way that this the Jesus and the apostles kept the Sabbath was they kept it as a day of rest. Right. Uh, so, so it just seems um, that I don't know. It, it just uh, I don't see how it follows. I, I don't see how his conclusion follows from that uh, from the evidence. The, the New Testament evidence seems to indicate that the Sabbath, the expression of the way we keep the Sabbath, is the same in the New Testament as it was in the Old Testament. Right. Let me ask you this: Do you think? Um... Because I, I don't see how it follows either, and I, and I think that, logically speaking, it doesn't. Do you think that possibly Rob presupposes that the church hasn't, because the church hasn't, um, at least for you know the majority of the church's time uh, since the first century, uh, has, has kept the seventh-day Sabbath? Um, do you think he, he uses that and almost presupposes what has to be that the Sabbath has changed and that's how he that's how he somehow sees that in the argument or that's the logical conclusion to it um um i don't know i i mean church tradition is mm -hmm. very uh you know it, it's very strong you know church church sure. tradition and, and so um you know obviously the most of church tradition um a different view on the sabbath than than you and i do it, and is right. more aligned with with what rob believes uh the majority of church tradition but um but yeah i you know i i don't know i i think he's trying to be honest with mm -hmm. the text but but he just i believe that his position is just overstated this discontinuity mm -hmm. between old and new testaments that that he's overstating his case that he's drawing conclusions that do not really follow from the evidence right. um and and you know I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure church tradition you know may be a factor or, or may influence him to some degree but speaking of church tradition i brought this up in the debate yeah. church tradition is not monolithic historic christianity on the topic of the sabbath is not monolithic um, I cited two 5th century church historians, Socrates mm -hmm. Scholasticus and Sozomen, both uh, testify that almost the entire Christian world outside of Alexandria and Rome continued to keep the Sabbath as late as the 5th century. Right. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's not accurate to say, it's not entirely accurate to say that the historical church, you know, has had a certain position on the Sabbath because... It was not universal. The, the mm -hmm. idea that the Sabbath uh, no longer applies was not a universal idea uh, among uh, Christians. Right. And, um, and it doesn't and remain universal today. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know where his head's at. I, I, would like sure. to be, I would like to be charitable and believe that he's doing his best to be honest with the yeah, text. Of course. And, and, of course. Yeah. Well, do you think, um, <clears throat> based on that, do you think that that's Rob's best argument when he would say that uh, this isn't explicitly stated in the New Testament? Or what do you think was his was his was his best point that maybe he made? Because we've been we've been kind of talking about the inconsistencies with his logic and uh, kind of tearing down a little bit of his his framework right. there. But is, is there something good that you you think he really like? Yeah, that was that was good. That was um, that was something I really had to engage with. So. His arguments against the Sabbath being required today, I, I do not. I, I think they were all pretty weak. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm not. I'm not just saying that. You know, I, I think that you know his main arguments boiled down to it's not explicitly repeated in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. A commandment does not have to be explicitly repeated to be reinforced. Yeshua and the apostles do reinforce the commandment. And, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, it does seem that continuity seems to be there. Uh, he says that there's a new expression of the commandment in the new covenant, but there's really no evidence of that, uh, right. according to the practice of the apostles. Um, he said that the Sabbath is given only to Jews, that Gentiles were not expected to keep the Sabbath. Again, uh, that does not seem to follow from the evidence because we see Gentiles keeping the Sabbath in the book of Acts, and it seems to be assumed in, in Acts 15.21 that they would be keeping the Sabbath mm -hmm. um, in the synagogues every week as they learned the Torah. Um, so I, I just uh, I, I thought all of those arguments were, were pretty weak. I, I thought they were just... Um, 
the evidence does, didn't really bear out those assertions. Mm -hmm. His his um, biggest argument, which he didn't really flesh out in the debate, um, he actually made a video where he did talk about the argument uh, after mm -hmm. the debate. So after the debate, a couple days after the debate, he made a video where he addressed this, uh, he fleshed out this argument a little bit more. He alluded to this, but his, I think his strongest argument what is actually against the uh, his his strongest argument is against my interpretation, the pronomian interpretation of Matthew five eighteen, because mm -hmm. the way that I take that verse is that nothing would pass away from the Torah until heaven and earth disappear and, and all is accomplished. I take that mm -hmm. to mean until the end of the age, until the consummation of the kingdom. Uh, you know, and, and the new heavens and new earth. So that's a future time. Nothing will pass away until then. Um, and so I think that's a very strong statement uh, that has implications for the Sabbath, because obviously the Sabbath is part of the law. And right. if, if nothing will pass from the law until that future time, that's a strong statement that tells us that the Sabbath is still for today. Right. And so his argument... Um, it, you know, he. There are some statements that that he points points to, like in the book of Hebrews, for example, mm -hmm. um, which, which are challenging to that position. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it, it seems some passages in Hebrews do seem to to say something different than what Matthew five eighteen seems to say. And so, of course, Rob interprets Matthew five eighteen in light of interpretation of these passages from hebrews right and so i think um the so i do think that's a strong argument the way that i would address it is this and i actually i made a video too um responding <laughs> to his video yeah. where i go in where i go into more detail but the first thing i would say is that matthew five eighteen seems to be unambiguous it, it's straightforward mm -hmm. uh new testament scholars uh widely um uh, agree that uh, that Matthew five eighteen is is unambiguous in what it right. says. So, a good rule of biblical hermeneutics is that we ought to interpret difficult passages in light of clear passages. So, I would say that uh, Hebrews is a much more difficult text. Ma Matthew mm -hmm. five eighteen is straightforward. It doesn't, you know, it, it's very logical and simple. Um, and book of Hebrews, on the other hand, is it's a lot of metaphor, a lot of elaborate midrashic arguments mm -hmm. um, and analogies and things like that. And so I think that we ought to interpret Hebrews in light of Matthew 518. And right. I think that there are that there is a good um, way to read Matthew 518. Um, or, or, I'm sorry, I, I think that you can read some of these challenging passages in Hebrews in a way that harmonizes them with Matthew 5, 18. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also point out, um, and, and you, uh, I, I would just uh, recommend that people go and watch the video on my channel mm -hmm. um, for more in information, but I would just point out that there are passages in the book of Hebrews that it itself that affirms the ongoing validity of the law. And there are passages in the book of Hebrews itself that seems to assume that things have not passed away yet. And, and right. so um, I, I, I'm not going to unpack all of it, but uh, I would I would recommend that people watch the, the video on my channel. I, I give mm -hmm. a much more in-depth uh, answer, um, and, and I go through those passages in Hebrews. But but that's that's the biggest challenge, I think, to pronomian pronomian interpretation of Matthew 518 mm -hmm. is uh, some of these challenging passages in Hebrews that that on the surface seem to say that things that some laws have already passed away. Yep. Um, yes, that was <clears throat> that was great. Um, guys, definitely go check out David's video. Uh, and if you want the full context of what Rob said prior, because David is responding to Rob, watch Rob's okay. video. Uh, see how he makes that argument. And then I would suggest watching David's after that to really have an idea of how he uh, frames up Rob's argument and, and shows some holes in that. <clears throat> and I, and I love that you, 
you bring up that uh, that principle of interpretation of we we interpret difficult passages in light of more simplistic, just explicit stated things in the Bible <clears throat> because uh, the I mean we would be we would be naive to say that the Bible is one hundred percent completely super easy to read and understand. That's just that's just not how it is. It's it's um, mm-hmm. it's not. Uh, and so sometimes you do have to like wrestle with things and wrestle with the with the word as as Hebrew says it's it's a living uh, two edged sword maybe a scalpel same word used uh, there for scalpel which is why I'm a Lucan authorship for Hebrews guy but uh, either way um, yeah so that kind of stuff I that that principle I, I, it needs to be employed uh, and I and that's the in the traditional like the orthodox understanding of. Uh, Matthew five eighteen <clears throat> is where you land. I'm pretty sure, just based on everything that I've read. Uh, so it seems like Rob is a little bit in a minority position there. Uh, go ahead. I, I I think I think the way that he handles Matthew five eighteen, I, I think it really mangles the text. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I demonstrate that in the video. I think is um, I think that the pronomian uh, position on these passages in Hebrews is much more exegetically sound mm-hmm. than, than the way that he is forced to, because of his presuppositions, the way that right. he is forced to address Matthew 518. Um, I, so, uh, yeah, there, there, and there's some really good recent scholarship on this, too. I, I, mm-hmm. cite, I cite it in my video. Uh, but uh, Dr. Matthew Thiessen's paper um, called um, uh, Hebrews and the Jewish Law. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and uh, there's another paper by Dr. Mary Schmidt on on uh, Hebrews 7.12 specifically, mm-hmm. uh, which talks about with the change in the priesthood, there's a change in the law. Uh, and so I cite those papers in the, in the video. But uh, so there's some really good recent scholarship that, that lines mm-hmm. up with the pronomian perspective. And, and I in my opinion, I think that uh, I think it's it's exegetically sound and uh, yeah. and it, it harmonizes with the most logical um, and exegetically sound reading of Matthew five eighteen. Right. Yeah. Love to see love to see harmony, uh, even if it takes a little bit of of getting in there and really getting your hands dirty with uh, interpreting text and and examining. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that it does give the most harmony, and that's why again we are. Pronomian. We're not here to do this because it's popular, uh, but we see harmony in in these interpretations, and it, it makes the most sense uh, that that's how this would be. So, yeah, thanks, David. Uh, that w- that was good. Um, I really don't have much more for you. Uh, I'd like to ask you though, uh, what do you believe was your absolute best argument that you had in the whole debate? Uh, like, what point you really made and, and drove home, uh, and 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 why? Oh, um, I guess probably the, uh, probably, probably my exegesis of Matthew 5, 17 through 20. I I think that that, that is, uh, I think that's probably, um, I mean, it's, it's just the go-to verse for us, right? I mean, it, it, uh, it is such a, it is such a unambiguous, powerful, uh, Mm -hmm. passage that, that really, uh, emphasizes and, and it's and it's you know directly um it, it's basically if you were to ask jesus is the law done away with matthew 5 17 through 20 would be his answer and right. it would and his answer is emphatically no <laughs> so it's it's so clear so straightforward that that i think uh i think that's i i just think that's the nail in the coffin honestly yeah. and um so and just the the assumed continuity uh, of the Sabbath commandment throughout right. Yeshua's teachings and the apostles' teachings and practice too. Right. Yes, I agree. The reason that Matthew five seventeen to twenty is invoked so much is uh, because it is that powerful. It is that straightforward. I just gave a sermon on on those four verses not too long ago, um, and it's almost like cliche that you're like, oh yeah, we're going to talk about Matthew five seventeen to twenty, but it's like you have the best argument. You have the words of God right there explaining explicitly and simply with with all kinds of cultural context with with um <clears throat> the the tyrant Antiochus being invoked with uh, right. Kataluo um yeah just just so much packed into that so guys definitely go get David's book because you will see that exegeted in his uh first I think it's chapter 1 right when you do an exegesis of Matthew 
uh, five. It is so good. It's worth the money just for that chapter alone. That's what I keep telling people. And then everything else is just bonus content. That's just piling on and just such good stuff. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so yeah, that was, that was good. I hope, um, I hope you guys get to watch the debate and, and get in there and, and I, actually, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan this question, but I'm going to ask you because I, uh, it kind of goes along with me too. Were there any questions that you wish you could have asked uh, Rob in cross exam that maybe you didn't get a chance to ask? Because I know I did, and I'm going to tell you what mine is in a minute. But uh, uh, I, yeah, I did not have enough time to ask all my questions. Uh, but um, I did uh, pull up my my document that I had. Um, I think. Uh, Another thing, another question I wanted to ask had to do with Matthew five um, seventeen through twenty. Uh, in in Matthew five nineteen, mm -hmm. Jesus said that whoever relaxes, um, which, which is related to that word abolish in in seventeen. Yeah, luo 17, is the Greek word there. Yeah, what what uh, Jesus said that whoever relaxes one of the least of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom. And so um, the Sabbath is hardly one of the least of God's commandments. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And so uh, I wanted to ask if uh, he was at all concerned that he might be leading people to be least in the kingdom by teaching them Ooh. that the Sabbath commandment is no longer required. And, and so that, that was, I, I just wanted to hear his uh, explanation on that. But yeah, that, that was a question I wanted to ask, uh, but didn't, didn't have time to, yeah. unfortunately. Uh I think that would be great because I mean, <laughs> that's a tough question because if you answer it one way, like if you like, and, and in my opinion, if you're consistent with your interpretation, mm -hmm. then, then you do, you have to admit that. But, um, yeah, I'm curious, maybe we can tweet him or something and he'll, he'll give us a quick little 140 character <laughs> yeah. reply. I, I actually tweeted him my question because in the chat, man, I was, we were, we were doing our watch party and I, I kept trying to ask this one question because uh, I, I really think it's a zinger. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of the idea that I had been talking to you about for, uh, a couple weeks before the debate <clears throat> in regards to under the law and his, what I can understand yeah. it is his, is his interpretation yeah. of that phrase under the law. <clears throat> um, and so I asked essentially, were you under the law before salvation? So like before your regeneration moment, were you, or while you were, because that's what it indicates is while you were under the law before mm -hmm. salvation, were you guilty of breaking the Sabbath and thus guilty in sin before God? And if you are, and if you were, then does Jesus's sacrifice do more than pay for your sin? Because it seems like it's redefining sin. So my, my the implications are that, before, before I was a, so, I mean, the, the understanding is like under the law you, to rob means you have to keep it. There are certain things like the Sabbath that you have to keep when you're under the law, but you don't keep when you're no longer under the law. <clears throat> but does that mean then let's just say, let's say Rob had never sinned against anything else. And all he ever did was break the Sabbath. And then Jesus appears to him and saves him, regenerates him and says, go and sin no more. But mm -hmm. Can Jesus say that if he removes Rob's ability to sin by breaking the Sabbath in redefining sin? Yeah, it's it's I I, I don't think I'm articulating that the best way, but I, like 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 a necroman uh, necromancy. A lot of people will say, even though you and I agree that it is explicitly stated as a continuation in Matthew five seventeen to twenty, because everything in the Torah is explicitly repeated by Jesus in that passage. But people like necromancy is never mentioned by name in the New Testament. <clears throat> Does that mean mm. Jesus can save somebody from being a necromancer? And then he would have to say, Hey, uh, go and do necromancy now because it's not sinful because I've redefined and taken you out from under the law that says that's sinful. Um, yeah. Don't, don't worry about it. Go, go right back to what you were doing. Yeah. That's, like, that's even, though that's, yeah. even though that's the action that damned you in the first place. Right. That, oh man, that's just like, that's, I want to be able to flesh that out. And I want to like, I'm going to spend, I, I, I think about that all the time. Uh, I want to flesh that out because I think there's something there. Um, and I would just love to hear Rob's response to that. If he was guilty of breaking Sabbath prior to his regeneration. And how does that make sense that he's no longer guilty of doing that on this side? If that's what's condemning him prior to his regeneration. 
I, I agree with you. There's something there. It needs to be fleshed out. Um, you ought to write an article on it, honestly, and uh, and maybe yeah. I'd try to flesh that out more. But uh, I, I, yeah, I would be interested in, in his response to that. Yeah, I asked the question, I, I guess, 40 times in the chat that night, all in like all caps, and they never picked it. Uh, and even our friend Raymond was like, ask or answer Josh's question or ask Josh's question. And so I just kept tweeting it to him afterwards. So maybe one day we'll get an answer. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll write something up, but all right. Well, this is, this has been great. Um, man, I appreciate you getting on here and talking and, uh, just, you know, having a good conversation about this. We've not got to talk about it much, uh, just, you know, life been busy, but, uh, I think this is this is a good, I guess, fourth video for people to watch after they watch the debate, the first Rob uh, rebuttal. It's almost like you guys did one more round of of rebuttals after the video. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, I just uh, I love the debate. I hope that we see more in the future. Uh, I hope maybe you and I can tag team something one day. I would love to do that. Uh, maybe we can get Rob and Andrew to to debate us on something that would yeah, just be yeah, so I'd, fun. <clears throat> I'd love that. Yep. All right. Well, we're going to call it a night, guys. Uh, thank you so much uh, again, David, for coming on. We always love you uh, coming on our show and, and talking. And uh, yeah, just, just a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much, man. It's a pleasure as always to be with you. All right, cool. All right, guys, we're signing out. Go check out davidwilber.com, uh, joshuainsley.org, uh, see our resources, go buy David's book, all the good stuff. We're out of here. <laughs>